Hi everyone, welcome to today's webinar on me mental health matters with me, Sarah Zaman, as your host, and Kat Lamin, Lamin <laughs> as your presenter. I was going to check that, Kat, with you before. Everyone always says my surname wrong, um, whom I shortly introduce. Um, I'm the, the CAS Community Outreach Manager for the North East Cumbria in Yorkshire, um, so I oversee the communities in that those areas and support the community, CAS community leaders there as well. Uh, this webinar is part of the CAS Virtual Showcase, which is a two-week window of webinars designed to support the CAS community. During the session, please use the question window on the right-hand side of your screen to ask questions. These will be private, they'll just go to me, um, and I, if I think that, um, you know, that's something that I want to say um, to Kat at the end, I will. Um, otherwise, I'll pass those questions on to, to Kat afterwards. Um, all attendees are in listen-only on, mode. Top of the window has got an orange rectangle, which can be expanded or collapsed. If you're using social media, um, and we really would love you to, the hashtag for this event is #casvirtual20. Um, so if you'd like to tweet about it, that would be brilliant. Um, I'll hand over to Kat now. Thank you. Okay. Hi everyone. Um, my name's Kat. Um, and I'm here to talk to you about mental health. Um, I'm just going to start off by saying I am not a qualified professional in mental health in any way, shape or form. I'm going to be talking about my own experiences, um, what I've come across. Uh, if you do have any questions that would require an experienced professional, please don't expect me to be able to answer them. Please don't take my word as law. Um, I thought about having some slides for this talk and then I thought, actually, do you know what? I'd rather just talk to you. Um, so, and, oh, and the other thing I was going to say is yesterday I ended up having keyhole surgery, so if I lose the plot completely, I apologise, but um, I have general anaesthetic and morphine and things, so yeah, if I go completely crazy, it's, it's not my fault, I promise. Um, so just a little bit about me, so you know who I am. I was a primary school teacher for a number of years, um, and for the last three or four years, I've been a, com a computing and digital technology consultant. Uh, some of you may know me from my work at PyTop a few years ago. Now I do a lot of work with Google and helping people rolling out digital platforms. Um, and I helped to write a scheme of work called Kapow Primary as well. So that's who I am. Uh, Specialising in computing and maths, because I'm really cool, <laughs> as you all know. Um, so why do I want to talk about mental health? It's very simple. Mental health issues are on the rise. Right now we're in lockdown and that's a breeding ground for mental health issues. A lot of people don't really know what we mean by mental health or what it's like to, ex to experience a mental health illness. And there's still a huge amount of stigma around having a mental health condition. In fact, I filled out a form last week for my son um, and it had the following statement. My child is in a home where someone has violence issues, anger issues or depression. And my first thought was that depression is completely different to violence and anger. How can you group those together? Um, yeah, and a lot of people I know want to help with mental health, but don't necessarily know how to deal with it. Um, because, you know, <laughs> you don't, if you haven't experienced it yourself, you can't imagine what it is. So I'm just going to start off by saying, you know, you will see me start to talk. And people tend to make assumptions when I'm talking. They'll assume I'm a confident person. I've asked in a, in a talk about this before, what do you see? And the general consensus is, OK, if somebody's outgoing, somebody's confident, someone who's quite enthusiastic, hyperactive. All those fun adjectives. I once got described as, um, oh no, I've forgotten the word now, but yeah, it was a word that meant everywhere. And I thought, okay, yep, yeah, yep, yeah, that's probably true. Uh, but what people don't see is that I struggle with my mental health a lot. And I've actually, since my first talk on this, which I think was two years ago, I've actually started to be really public about my mental health problems. Um, and so when I do have an issue, I'll tend to post about it on social media, not for sympathy. But just to highlight the fact that somebody who comes across so confident does sometimes struggle. So to talk you through me as a person, um, I've had depression since I was 19, or at least that's when I was first diagnosed with it. And it's come back throughout my adult life. Um, sometimes there's a reason behind it. So when my dad died, of course, I struggled a lot emotionally. Uh, sometimes there is no cause. Some days I just struggle for no reason. I also struggle with anxiety and low self-esteem. That's particularly been an issue in the last three months. I've been medicated twice in my life. Um, I'm not a big fan of taking med medication, uh, but yeah, I have been um, hospitalised once. I have days where I just can't get out of bed in the morning. It's been a lot harder since I've had a baby who's nearly one year old. But yeah, some days I struggle to get out of bed in the morning. Uh, in the winter, I often struggle with SAD, seasonal affective disorder, which means everything's a lot harder, a lot bleaker. Um, I consider myself to be quite empathetic and I 
often break down when I feel someone else is struggling. So I will have a sort of empathetic breakdown in sympathy with them. Um, and then I'm sure many people here have heard of imposter syndrome, but that's something I regularly struggle with. It's this idea that um, you don't feel like you're qualified enough. So right now I don't feel like I'm qualified to talk about my own mental health, which is my life experience. Um, so what, you know, what does it mean for me if I'm suffering from depression? Because the difficult thing for people to understand is that while it is a psychological problem, it's also a physical problem because the two things come hand in hand. So when I'm suffering from a depressive incident, I have no energy. I can't stand up sometimes. I feel like I'm always tired and I can't stop crying over ridiculous things, you know, an advert on the TV that's not even that sad. Um, I can't control my diet, so I'll eat more, I'll eat less. I'll eat things that are terrible for me. I start getting twitchy and irrational. Um, and then I go into this feeling where I refuse to believe anything nice anyone says. So if somebody says something nice to me, my brain will respond back, no, they don't mean that. They don't mean that at all. In fact, I had this about three or four weeks ago, I had a day where I just felt like everybody hated me and people were just being nice. And there was no rationale behind it. There was a group of ladies that I talked to because we'll have similar age babies. And I became irrationally convinced that none of them really liked me. That there was no signs or signals. It was just my brain relaying this message saying that, these aren't your friends they don't like you um and i can only when i'm in that sort of state i can only view the negative and i just cried and i'm really lucky i have supportive family my my partner's incredible i'm pointing to the chair he normally sits in he's not there right now um and so he looked after me he bundled me into bed got me some ice cream looked after the baby for a while um yeah and then i got this and i get this idea that nobody really cares or values my opinion which links to the imposter, imposter syndrome and that leads down to the spiral of feeling like people will be better off without me. And I know the whole time I'm feeling this, I know that it's not true, but I can't fight it and I can't push it away because that bit of my brain that's telling me it's not, it's not right, nobody likes you is far stronger than the bit that's saying you're making, it's just your depression talking. Um, and so I have to do some things which sound really silly, but I have to reach out to a friend. And you think, oh, that's easy, but it's not. When you're struggling with depression, writing two words, help me, is the hardest thing you can do, or saying them. I have sat on my phone and text, written a message to my best friend and deleted it, and written it and deleted it whilst crying when I'm struggling with depression. So if somebody ever reaches out, that is pretty much one of the hardest steps it, uh, someone can take when they're struggling. Um, Sometimes knowing somebody cares can really, really help when you're struggling to cope. Um, and having those people to rely on. So as I said, I'm really lucky. I have a really good family here with my partner. I have some really good friends that I know won't judge me. In fact, I've developed quite a good online community of friends who I know I can rely on. I can message if I don't feel like I can talk to somebody else. Like last time I struggled, I couldn't message my best friends, but I could reach out on Twitter. It was a very bizarre feeling. Um, and one of the things I often do is, is write things down. So when I'm struggling, I'll write it all down, even when it's ludicrous, and then often I'll delete it. Um, and yeah, I just have to keep repeating this idea that my brain is telling me these crazy things, but they're not true. So one of the questions, when I was teaching, I, my, my school knew that I suffered from depression and they asked me not to tell the parents or not to tell the students because there was this idea that a teacher suffering from a mental health condition wouldn't be a capable teacher. And I understood their perspective completely because there are plenty of adults who would feel that way. I know that my teaching was never affected by my depression. My teaching wasn't affected particularly when my dad died. Um, but I also know that there would be parents and adults who would automatically see the stigma of a mental health issue as a reason that I shouldn't be teaching. And it was interesting because I did this talk a few years ago and I asked, should a person work um, or what, were there any jobs that people didn't think that we could do if we suffered from a mental health condition? And someone actually responded, knowing that I'm a teacher, people shouldn't be doing jobs where their illness would impede their ability to perform from their job of a physical, highly dangerous or stressful nature, e.g. teaching. 
So they felt that if your job is stressful, you shouldn't be able to do it if you have a mental health condition. Um, and it's, it is, you know, that's, that's, that's a perfectly reasonable response when you look at it objectively, but actually, I personally don't agree with that. I think that as long as you are able to talk about it and be open about it, why should having a mental health condition stop you from working in a job that you love? Um, I manage my condition by talking to my friends, by letting people know when I'm struggling, by recognising it. Um, and I know, example, I know, for example, a teacher who suffers from bipolar and anxiety. Um, she mentioned to me that she's had anxiety and low self-esteem all her life. She's been hospitalised a few times. Um, she has to take monthly blood tests in case the, the medication she takes for her bipolar disorder affects her organs and ECGs to check her anxiety isn't damaging her heart. Um, she's still an excellent teacher. She teaches computer science in a special needs school. But all of those things are just a part of who she is. Uh, so it's really important that we recognise that people around us are likely to be struggling for, with mental health concerns. I also know a developer who works with young people as part of his work, um, who has made multiple attempts on his life. He used to self-harm. And he had this difficult decision to make when he was working with young people. He has cuts along his arms. Should he hide them? And his first thought was he should, but he spoke to his managers and they said, actually, no, I think it's important that you own who you are. And actually it's been a starting point for conversation with some young people, particularly teenagers, because teenagers who are struggling to cope don't have anyone that they can talk to as a role model because we still don't talk about the fact that we have mental health conditions we still don't openly admit to it so as I said I was told not to in my school now interestingly I had a parents evening and I was teaching year five and the parents came to me and said that their daughter in year five had just been diagnosed with clinical depression um, and there were various reasons around that, including the loss of another parent in school who died in a tragic accident. Um, and I was able to covertly reassure the parents that I was I was able to support their daughter. And actually, that was really important to them. So they understood what I was saying, that I too suffered from depression. And it reassured them and made them feel safe and comfortable. And that's the kind of thing we need to see more and more, just this idea that it's okay to not be okay it's okay to struggle um now right now we are in a particularly difficult situation um we're not seeing our students we're not seeing our colleagues on a day-to-day -day basis that means that things are going unnoticed particularly mental health problems um we've got a lot of young people we as teachers are naturally empathetic i would say most teachers without thinking worry about and care about their children um, and it's harder for us to spot those things that aren't going well. And I think it's really important that we think about ways that we can try and support both first our students and then our colleagues and then ourselves. So what I personally recommend for teachers is that they do at least one check-in a week with a group of students via webcam. Um, and it sounds silly, but having that opportunity for a video conversation with somebody and a giggle, and that's really important, having that giggle is far more important than trying to teach a concept. Um, a concept can be taught via a paper worksheet if it needs to. It's not the best way to do it, but it can be done. But having a fun time and making your pupils feel safe and confident is far more important. Things like an online scavenger hunt, find in your house something that begins with the letter D. You know, those sort of, sort of things can really make a difference. And it's not just your students, it's their parents too. If you can, do a check-in with parents. I know that sounds silly again, but they're struggling. They're at home all day with their children. Um, and many of them are probably in a dark place. Some of them may not be able to work for one reason or another. Some of them may have lost their jobs. Many of our children and parents might have lost someone. Uh, so even if it's a monthly phone call to parents just to see how they're coping, it's really important that we think about these people in our community. And then an important one is your colleagues. Your colleagues are probably also struggling. There are, there are probably plenty of times where you've missed someone 
but if you don't necessarily struggle for mental health you can't imagine the feeling of isolation that you can get when you're stuck at home um, and you haven't got anyone to talk to um, and it's, it's, it's it can be really isolating even if you've got your family around you you can feel lost and alone um, and I think it's fairly important that schools do something that teachers just make sure that those staff members who might not be that confident are okay. So for example, something we started doing at the beginning of lockdown was to have three times a week, a mental health staff room. And that's a global event. We're cutting it down to one a week now as uh, people are back to work or in the US they're on their school holiday. Um, and the purpose behind the global staff room was just to check in with teachers and at first we talked about education we talked about strategy we talked about ways to support one another um but now three months in it's become a group of friends having a giggle we talk about chocolate we talk about the fact that in australia fish and chips is made with shark um and we laugh a lot and it makes a huge difference to every single well as far as i'm aware every single person there we have people who come in just to listen. They don't want to talk, they just want to have some light-hearted silliness going on in the background, um, which shows you the importance of that kind of thing. And I would urge you, if you've not done so already, to consider having staff rooms that are virtual within your school, um, where you just have a chance for a bit of silliness, where you maybe do a quiz or have a little departmental laugh one with a glass of wine. It's just so important to have that opportunity to laugh with friends. Um, I, I have multiple groups, I don't know about the rest of you, but my WhatsApp is utterly crazy from the different groups I chat to. And sometimes we arrange um, hangouts, we, we go onto Google Meet and we have a little chat. And there are some people who don't feel comfortable doing that. And I just keep an eye and see, okay, who hasn't spoken for a while, are they okay? Um, and I think, again, that's a really important thing to do, just who's not, been getting involved because sometimes I know a lot of people in this period have completely detached from technology they don't want to be involved but it's nice to be able to just check in on them and send them a message because even if they're not really interested in talking just knowing someone that is out there is really really important um so I'm just gonna yeah so I was just thinking but about a week ago I had a strange little mental health blip as well um I lay on my bed and it's about four o'clock. I was absolutely fine until then. And then I couldn't move. And that just came out of nowhere. Um, and as far as I can tell, the root of it was that I didn't have a donut. But I think it was a combination of different feelings. They'd all built up on me and, and it all overwhelmed me. And I spent the rest of the evening in bed. And that's how quickly mental health can creep up on you. So. I'm sure you want to know what you can do to help as well. Um, and I just, my main point that I want to say to you over and over again is that mental health is no different to physical health. If you suffer from an autoimmune disease or a broken leg even, there are going to be good days and there are going to be bad days. And that's true of mental health. I have days where I am absolutely fine. And I have to admit, there have been more of them than ever lately. Um, again, I've got a nearly one year old, so that does help. Um, mental health and physical health are directly connected. Sometimes just knowing someone cares can make a huge difference. Uh, and if someone appears to be struggling, just those little kind words, just sending a message saying, I was really impressed with what you did, or I miss you, or your fun i don't know something little um and just i want to reiterate that point i made earlier if somebody asks for help that's not an attention seeking thing that's not a, someone um just being a pain or being awkward that is a really big psychological step um I try not to treat us like we're weirdos i had a friend who bless him when he found out i struggled with my mental health started treating me with kid gloves and I, uh, that didn't help at all. Um, so don't treat us differently, like we're weird or special or need to be tiptoed around. Think about how would I treat this person if they'd broken their leg? Help them, but I wouldn't patronize them. 
Um, for those of you who are in senior leadership, I would urge you to open a discussion with your staff about mental health um, because something like one in three people I use, I've lost my statistics, I, I do have them somewhere, but one in three, I think it is, struggle with mental health problems. Um, 300,000 people with mental health problems leave their jobs each year. It's really important that you make your workplace a safe place where people feel comfortable admitting that their mental health isn't 100%. Um, so yeah, senior leadership, I would urge you to make help your staff feel comfortable with supporting one another, with listening to one another, with acknowledging they're sick. I was very lucky that my school actually let me take a mental health day when I needed it. Um, and I think it's, I mean, there are always going to be people who take the mick and there's always going to be a risk that if someone says they're struggling with their mental health, maybe they won't be, but I think it's too important, too valuable to not let staff know that if they're struggling, they can take that time because a teacher whose mental health is not okay is not going to be able to teach properly um, and if we get into too dark a place then how can we be effective supporters of our young people um please please i'm going to keep saying this please check in with one another check in with teachers if you are struggling with your mental health please talk to someone um, i'm on twitter at cat lamin message me uh, i'm not going to be upset if i get a message from someone saying i'm struggling please i need to talk to somebody um come to one of our mental health matters staff room they're at 8 p.m. on Sundays at the moment. Um, I don't have the link handy, but I'm sure it will appear on my Twitter feed at some point. And we just have a giggle. It can be a really big step if you are struggling to join in with a chat. You could just log in, mute your camera, mute your microphone and listen. And then when you feel more confident, speak. You don't have to say anything. We don't force you to. Don't keep, don't let your brain tell you that you're not good enough, that you're not welcome, because you are. You are good at your job, that's why you're here. People who aren't good at their job don't attend training. <laughs> so don't let your brain tell you that you're not good enough, even when it is telling you that. Uh, we're all struggling right now, and we're all in lockdown, and I know it's easing a bit, but it's for those of us who are more apprehensive, this is a scary time because we see people almost forgetting that things are over and it makes the anxiety almost feeling like things are over so it makes our anxiety rise i feel like if i go outside right now there's going to be a huge risk to myself because people don't care but i'm sure there's not i live in an area where there's been fairly low cases at the worst of times and yet my fear my anxiety is raging um i'm already running out of things to say and i've only been talking for 20 minutes so there is there is a thriving at work review you can look at. I think that was made in 2016, um, and it suggests things like create a mental create a mental health at work plan, build mental health awareness by making information and support accessible, encourage open conversations, um, provide good working conditions, and ensure employees have a healthy work life balance. Now let's be honest, we don't as teachers. Work life balance is shockingly poor for teachers, especially right now, because I'm sure many of you are planning lessons delivering lessons delivering in school teaching um doing stuff online take time and stop don't feel like everybody else comes first um and it's just really important that you monitor your own and everyone else's mental health around you just be there to support people to listen to people um i'm just trying to think if there's anything else i have to say but i think i've talked for 25 minutes and run out of things to say that, that's absolutely fine, uh, Kat. If we, we've got a couple of things to ask you from the questions anyway. Mm -hmm. um, so somebody said, um, she, she wants you to know this, thank you for talking um, from personal experience. It was interesting to know that I'm not the only one. It's okay to stop. It's okay to struggle and to reboot. There are a lot of pressures out there that not only do we need to find a path for ourselves, but for the children that we teach as well, just by being there in a simple, hello, how are you? So that was quite yeah. nice. I saw um I saw some schools were making videos for their children, primary schools in particular. I thought that was really lovely. And then there was one school and I felt kind of disheartened actually because none of the videos had the teacher's face in. They all just made cool, whizzy animations. 
And I thought, no, the, te the children don't really want to see that. They want to see your face. They want to see that you care. So, yeah. Yeah, I agree with that as well. There's a time and a place for bit more G's or whatever they are. <laughs> um, yeah. And then just as somebody's just said it again, but I think you might have covered that. Just any ideas where I can find a virtual staff room other than Google? Um, um, so the only ones I'm afraid, the only ones I know are that, I mean, you don't have to be on Google to join our one. To be honest, it started off, we talked about using Google and other tools. It's just hosted on a Google Meet. So don't be put off by the fact it's Google. Um, and I know that um, C Learning, Paul Farrell also hosts the staff room. And again, it's on a Google Meet, but it's not Google specific as far as I'm aware. Um, I will ask around and see if there are any other staff rooms that are non Google. So again, follow my Twitter. Um, and if I do find anything, I will post it up. In fact, I'll write a tweet right now as we're talking. That's that's really good. So um, Kat's Twitter, I'll put into. Hold on. I've, I've got echoing. Um, I'll put Kat's Twitter into the chat so you all have it so that you can follow her. But um, if you're not on Twitter, I'll get Kat to share those um, ideas with me and then I can get those out to you as well because you've um, signed up. That's Kat's uh, Twitter there. Um, let me just have a look if there's any more questions. Uh, yes, there is a question. Um, what are, what are your thoughts about a time when all or nearly all return to school? Um, in terms of mental health? Yes. So I would say that we've got a lot of checking up to do because I know for myself as a primary school teacher, I spent a lot of time, a lot of my break times, lunch times, dealing with what we think of as PSHE issues. Um, checking in with the students, checking in, sorting out what's going on sometimes it's stuff at home sometimes it's stuff in school i think we we need to spend some time when schools return doing what would be circle time in primary school just giving children the chance to talk about what's going on in their lives giving them an open forum in small groups to share and feel comfortable i think we need to explicitly say that we we are aware that mental health is not going to have been good that people are going to struggle um i, I always find it really odd that people don't realize that how it feels to have a mental health condition so and I, I thought it was actually perfectly normal that I felt like people didn't like me at times and it never occurred to me that this was actually part of my mental health um, so yeah it's, it's important that we open that discussion and say that this is normal this is or not normal this is part of a struggle it's not real and you need to think about ways to deal with it but I think we need to open that discourse with our students does that answer the question? Yeah, it does. That's really good. Um, and other than that, Kat, just loads of thank yous, um, you know, about sharing your uh, personal thoughts. Lots of people saying, you know, they appreciate you being so open. Um, yeah, lots of positives. That's That was just really, really helpful. Thank you. And and speaking from the heart, I just think, I think that's, you know, what a lot of people don't do nowadays. So Thank you very much for that. Really, really I good. I just feel really passionately that we need to normalise mental health and stop it being a big stigma. So if I can help in my small way just by talking honestly about my own mental brain, then, you know, it's the least I can do. I don't mind. I'm not embarrassed. I'm not in a classroom anymore, so I don't have to worry about parents judging me. <laughs> if they want to judge me, that's their loss. Um, so, yeah. I'm lucky to have that forum to be able to say, Do you know what? Yes, I struggle. Yeah, it's right. Yeah, just loads more thank yous, Kat, just coming through. Loads more thank yous. I think what I took from that as well is I didn't realise, you know, the, the things that you were talking about, virtual staff rooms. Um, you know, I speak to quite a lot of teachers and they are, you know, not all of them, but some of them are doing this virtual staff room every week, but some aren't. Um, yeah. So I, th I do think that's that's great. You know, if I'm taking anything away, one of the things would be virtual staff rooms. But also what you were saying about with the children as well, checking in with the children. I know, I mean, I've got a 13 year old and nobody's checked in with us at all. Not checked in with me, not checked in with him. Now, you know, in one respect, that's great because I'm not getting any hassle. But in another, you know, I'm not, you know, I may be OK, but other families may not, um, yeah. you know. And it's not hassling and they may feel like it's hassling but it's important see so it's, it's a scary time for children isn't it you know they don't know um what's happening children who are going you know transitioning 
from primary to secondary they just need that i don't know support don't they so um yeah really really interesting cat thank you um thank you I mean, I think from my personal perspective as a parent now as well if you know if a teacher phoned to say okay look we, we want to hear about your child but also how are you how are you coping i think you know as a, as an adult it's very rare we actually ask someone genuinely how are you yeah. we'll say you know, how are you yeah very well thank you but i think it's so important that we think about each other right now because there's so much going on yeah i agree totally um well thanks thanks Kat. I, you know I, I can't thank you enough really really good thank you i know like like i said lots of thank yous how many times are we going to say thank you but thank you loads of thank yous coming through um thanks so for coming and watching and listening to me no thank, <laughs> thanks again <laughs> I'll just keep saying thank you um and thanks to everybody else for for joining us today as well as well as Kat um I think I've talked my personal highlights if, it, if it's highlights but you know the things that I've, I've I've taken from this I've sh I'll be sharing some stuff on Twitter as well but do share yours your thoughts on this via social media um and like I say you've got Kat's um Twitter so please you know tag her in so that she can see what what you thought um, and also, you know, CAS website, CAS Facebook primary group, CAS secondary primary group, we're all there, we're all there supporting you as well. So, you know, anything that you feel like you want to put that, you know, we're, we're there. Um, so anyway, at the end of this anyway, webinar, the a short this survey will appear. Green, and we'd be grateful if you could take a minute to complete the survey. And in about a week's time, you'll receive an email with a CPD certificate confirming your attendance at this session. A uh, recording of this webinar will be available on the CAS website in about a week's time. We we'll hope to see you at other sessions in the showcase. Please do continue to spread the word about Mental Health Matters um, and the first ever CAS virtual showcase. Um, thanks again. I know you've sent through loads of thanks, <laughs> loads of them. Um, so thanks for that as well. For that, and I'm going to go before I echo any more and hope to see you all next time. All right. Thanks for that. All right. Bye, everyone. Thank you.